everyone, my name is Lindsay and you're watching Lindsay Cat Adventure and today we are adventuring through another Bible story just like we do every Friday. It's actually Friday evening here um, right now so I'm going to get this to you on Friday at some point, I promise it's going to happen. <laughs> it's just so many things have happened today so we're, we're going to make this work, okay? Um, so today we are going to be looking at the story of King Jehoshaphat. And we find this story in the in Second Chronicles. His story starts in chapter 17 and goes to 21, but we're also going to kind of look a little bit at chapter 14 to 16, which is about his dad, King Asa. So King Asa was the third king of Judah, and King Jehoshaphat was the fourth king of Judah, um, which means that King Jehoshaphat was David's great, great, great grandson. Um, yeah. So, a few little interesting notes about um, the two of them, so King Asa and King Jehoshaphat. So Asa, um, if we look in chapter 14, we see in verse 8, um, it tells us how many warriors that Asa had, basically, on his staff, like his standing army. And he had 580,000 soldiers, and in... Chapter 17, between verses 12 and 19, it tells us that King Jehoshaphat had 1,160,000 soldiers. And if you do the math, that's exactly twice as many as Asa had. So that's kind of interesting. Um, when we see things that are doubled in scripture, it's, it's always something to take note of because usually that... Um, has to do with God's blessing because God only multiplies. He doesn't just add. He, he has to work in multiplication. And so we see um, God's blessing whenever there's multiplication in the Bible. So that's just something to keep an eye on for you. Um, now, there was also something else about King Asa and King Jehoshaphat um, that were interestingly paralleled. Um, a few other things. Um, so... In chapter 15, verses 1 to 7, we see the prophet Azariah um, coming to talk to King Asa, and he says a whole bunch of stuff. And in amongst it, in verse 3, it says, For a long time Israel has been without the true God, without a teaching priest, and without law. And in chapter 17, verses 7 to 9, we see King Jehoshaphat, um, send out 16 uh, teaching priests and Levites to teach all of Judah the law, um, the law of God, and also, I think it was, no, let's just leave it at that, the law of God. It was also a little bit of secular law, um, trying to kind of bring it all together in one coherent sort of thing. Um, now, in amongst all of this, um, this, this prophecy from King Azariah, which... King Asa kind of did act on to a certain degree. We see in verse 9, so chapter 15, verse 9 to 15, we see that King Asa, you know, he was encouraged by um, everything that King, uh, that uh, prophet Azariah said. Um, go read it, go read it. It's really awesome. Um yeah, so he was encouraged and he gathered all of Judah and Benjamin together, so his whole kingdom. Um, he gathered them together and they had this huge offering. They offered thousands of sheep and hundreds of bulls and they all, you know, individually as, you know, men and women and children, um, they all were coming with their whole hearts to seek our God and it was this huge memory event, like there was this moment in time where because of this prophecy through this guy called Azariah the king took note and he was there and he did um he 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 took action and every single person in the entire kingdom was involved and it would have been something that they remembered and talked about for years or even generations possibly um and so this is a little side note um yeah, memory events are those times in our lives where we think back to and it's like this pivotal moment in our lives where something big and emotional kind of happened um, and it has an impact on the way that we go forward in our lives. Um, 
So yeah, that's that's what I see happening here in this chapter. In chapter 15, there's this memory event, there's this reform that's happening in a big emotional kind of way. And for a while, it actually really worked. Um, now, after a little while, King Asa uh, made a poor decision um, about trying to ally with the king of Syria. And this word ally comes up um, a few times, so keep your ears open for it. Um, now, because he made this ally alliance with the king of Syria against the king of Israel, um, God sent an, a different prophet called Hanani um, and said, from now on, you're going to have wars because you've chosen to basically get help from a mere human and not turn to me and ask me for help like you did, you know, way back when. So originally in the, um, in the, in chapter 14, where I said he's got, you know, half a million people, they were actually facing an army of over a million people. And, you know, it was two to one and they should have been defeated, but they didn't. And they completely destroyed their enemy and got even more plunder from the, the towns that were helping the enemy and all this kind of thing. And so you'd think that would be a good memory event for um, King Asa to, you know, have in the back of his mind. But as the years went on, he... You know, didn't look to God the same way he did towards the beginning of his reign. And even when he had a disease in his feet, he didn't even ask God for help. He only asked the doctors. And after a couple of years of this serious disease, he ended up dying. And so King Jehoshaphat is now taking over. And so King King Asa, Asa King Asa, goodness, I need to slow down. <laughs> so King Asa was generally considered a pretty good king. I mean, at the end, when he received this prophecy from Hanani um, that he was doing the wrong thing and that he would have wars, then King Asa put uh, the prophet Hanani into prison and he ended up pers persecuting um, some of his own people. And so he probably wasn't well liked for the last little bit. Um, and then he died with this disease in his feet. Um, but yeah, for the majority of his reign, he actually did pretty much the right thing. He tried to turn people's hearts back to God, but in the end, he didn't continue to seek after God, which was his downfall, really. And so we come to King Jehoshaphat now. And so King Jehoshaphat, he sends out um, these 16 teaching priests and Levites. We see this in chapter 17, verse 7 to 9. So, um, yeah, so... I can't even remember if I've already said this. So the prophet Azariah said um, in chapter 15, verse 1 to 7, and especially in verse 3, for a long time Israel has been without the true God, without a teaching priest, and without law. And so he said that to King Asa, and then King Jehoshaphat, years later, has acted on that even more than King Asa did. So King Asa did this one big party where they sacrificed hundreds of bulls and thousands of sheep, but now King Jehoshaphat is actually revisiting in his mind that original prophecy and going, oh, well, are the people being taught anything or um, or was it just this one big party and that's, that's it? So he sends out 16 um, priests and Levites who are there to teach the people the law. So they go on this tour around the kingdom of Judah and they go to the cities and they teach the people the law. And some people in commentaries that I've been reading have said that um, they think that this law wasn't necessarily like the first five books of the Bible as we would consider the books of the law, but more likely um, an early version of the book of Deuteronomy, which I think is the fifth book of the Bible. Um, yeah, so it's like all the stuff that, all the laws that Moses had to write down. And so yeah, so they actually, so King Jehoshaphat actually acted on the prophecy um, and that part that says that, you know, the land has been without people to teach the people the law. And we know that that verse that says, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. And so Jehoshaphat acted on this going, we need people to know the law so that they can live it. And so he deliberately funds 16 guys to go around the country and you know get them to teach everyone so that they can 
move further and further away from their idols, from all the different things that they're doing wrong, um, and move closer and closer to God. And so we see throughout King Jehoshaphat's life that he did a bit better than his dad did, which is wonderful. Um, in some ways, but in other ways, he had different problems. And so I want to talk to you guys a little bit about family ties that I found um, in, like, just throughout King Jehoshaphat's story. So just some of the family members or close relations that are mentioned in his story. So we, we've already spoken a little bit about King Asa, his dad, who was mostly good, except a little bit at the end. Um, pretty sure I mentioned that he was King David's great, great, great grandson. Um, so that's kind of helps us figure out how far along in the story this is. Um, okay. So it mentions in, I think it's chapter 15, I'm pretty sure. Yes. In chapter 15, verse 16, it talks about Maka. So this is King Asa's mum and um, King Jehoshaphat's grandma. Um, she was an idol worshipper and she set up this obscene idol of Asherah, who was like a fertility goddess of the Canaanites who were always there before um, the Israelites came along. And it's obscene because if it's a fertility goddess, you can kind of imagine what it might look like. Um, yeah. And she's doing this while Asa is trying to make these reforms. And I see this as like spiritual warfare, like Satan hates it when we have a reformation in our hearts. And he comes along and tries to bring distraction. And because um, Maka was actually the queen mother and that put her in a very high position of influence, she would have had a lot of people look up to her and see her as, you know, this person in the royal family. Um, she's worshipping this fertility goddess, so it must be okay because she's royal and she's related to the king, she's the king's mom, and so we can go do that as well. And so while there's all these reforms coming in to um, remove all the idolatry, she's actually bringing in idolatry at the same time, and that's bringing disunity into the royal family. And I love what King Asa does. He actually deposes her as the queen mother and says, you can't be, you can't have this title of queen mother. You can be my mom, but in public, you do not have this political level. Like he had to publicly declare her as a commoner now, which would have been very humiliating for her. Um, and obviously he got rid of and destroyed that Asherah pole. So there's this person who is King Jehoshaphat's grandma trying to bring in satanic stuff into, into the country, into the family. So he's got that in the background to deal with. Um, yeah, and that could be causing confusion for the people. Then uh, King Jehoshaphat also made some interesting political alliances of his own. Um, which were not very wise. So mostly his alliances that we see are with Israel and the kings of Israel specifically. So the way he originally tried to ally with King Ahab was by marrying his son. What's his name? His son's name is King uh, Jehoram. So yeah, he would have become King Jehoram. So he married his son Jehoram to Ahab's daughter. And we know that Ahab is like the worst king in Israel's history, right? He married Jezebel and Jezebel had all these priests and priestesses of Baal and, you know, they tried to kill um, Elijah and there was all that stuff going on. So Elijah's in the background of all this story as well. Um, he, he doesn't make an appearance in, in Jehoshaphat's story personally, as far as I can remember. Um, but yeah, anyway, so... King Jehoshaphat marries his son to King Ahab's daughter. And we see in, where is it? Um, chapter 21, verse 6, it says that this was actually really bad because um, King Jehoram walked in the ways of the kings of Israel just as the house of Ahab had done because he had the daughter of Ahab as a wife. So because King Jehoshaphat decided he wanted to have a political alliance with Ahab, King Ahab, it, 
the way they did that in those days was to marry either either to marry uh, the daughter of the king yourself or to have one of your own children marry, you know, the son or daughter of another neighboring king. And so that's what's going on here. He's like, let's seal this alliance by having a marriage in the family. But because he did that, he actually did worse for the kingdom of Judah in, in the long run because his son was then corrupted by King Ahab's family um, and had all their idolatry and all their evil practices that they did. Um, and he took that on and he, yeah, he made Judah kind of just like Israel um, in that next kingship after King Jehoshaphat. So Jehoshaphat would have had really good reasons probably to want to ally with Ahab. Ahab was, if you if you know your Bible really well, you'll know that Ahab um, was the king in Israel's history that had the most um, political uh, terrain. Like he 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 owned more um, space and terrain than um, King David did, and we think. King David is like the biggest conqueror, but actually um, King Ahab had more influence over more area than King David did. And so there's this guy up in the north in the kingdom of Israel, now that Judah and Israel are split, um, and he's becoming more powerful. And if there is not good relations between, uh, joy, the, between the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel, then Israel can easily come down and cut off trade for Judah from the neighboring um, countries. There was a lot of um, international trade going on, which was part of, you know, the economic wealth. Um, or they could just come down and attack with their military force as well um, and take over. Or, you know, there's all these different implications for having a powerful northern, you know, um, kingdom. Um, and so he would have wanted there to be good relations. At first, I thought it was just like, oh, maybe he wants them to be one big happily family, you know, of, you know, the kingdom of Israel all over again. But there's actually more political reasons to that than just wanting to be, you know, back to the good old days of like King David when there was just one big kingdom. Um, yeah, so he thought the best way he could have um, safety um, and political you know, unity and wealth. And there was another, um, like, alliance that the king of Israel had, obviously, with the king of Tyre because his wife Jezebel came from Tyre um, and that's where the idolatry came in. So now that Judah wants to ally with Israel because Israel has already allied with Tyre, there's these three who are, like, attached to each other. Um, and that brings like a big continu contiguous state um, that are in alliance um, in a very economically um, well positioned piece of land, basically, where everyone had to come through this space to do their trade between, you know, Egypt and uh, Mesopotamia and, you know, the northern Mediterranean, like Greece, that area, like it's a very central location, a very, very important trade route for the entire known world at the time. And so for them to be allied, it's great for them from an economic position. But because the king of Judah was supposed to be this one who was following God, now that he's looking out for his, you know, political position from like an, an economic, you know, money kind of standpoint, he's turning himself subtly away from God and he didn't even realize it. And he didn't realize how big of an impact it would have on the future of the country and like the spiritual health of his people. So yeah, so he, he made some personal decisions, some political decisions that actually just turned out really poorly in the end. Um, by marrying his son to Ahab's daughter, his son was lost, you know, and a lot of generations after that became bad kings. Um, his covenant with Israel, um, he warred alongside Israel with their enemies and in the end, Jehoshaphat nearly died when um, one of the warring countries wanted to go after Ahab and Ahab, you know, dressed like a commoner, but he ended up dying anyway. Um, yeah, Jehoshaphat's life was put in danger because of his um, alliance with Israel. 
Um, he also allied with Ahaziah, who was Ahab's son, who was just as bad. Um, and they wanted to build ships to go to Tarshish, wherever that is. I think that's somewhere in the Mediterranean. Um, but before the ships could even be put out to sea, they were destroyed somehow. And God sent a prophet who was actually the son of Hanani, who Asa put into prison because he was angry at the message. So Jehu, the son of Hanani, came with a message saying, because you have made this alliance with Ahaziah, you're, you're not going to have like any kind of victory in that space. So I think God like allowed them to make these alliances, you know, firstly Asa with the king of Syria and then, you know, Jehoshaphat with the kings of Israel. And these were all, you know, bad countries to be spiritually allying yourself with. Um, and God gave them an, op an opportunity to do better you know, he was right there saying, I'm, I'm here, I can help you. But because they chose a more worldly perspective, um, they ended up not being successful. And as I kind of processed this, this one thought came to me was who we ally ourselves with can determine our success or failure in life. And I just like really want you to think about that. Like who, who do you have in your life that is determining whether you are successful or a healthy kind of person um, who can grow and move forward in the calling that God has placed on your life? Or are there people in your life who are toxic um, or who are just bringing out the worst in you or who are saying that, you know, you're not good enough to do whatever you think God's called you to do. So why, why are you dreaming big? It's like, stop dreaming so big. Those kind of things. Um, and that reminded me of a story from my own life. So if you'll bear with me just a little bit longer, let me just tell you about when I first started college. Um, in my first year, um, I actually, so before that, my family environment um, was quite toxic for most of my life, really. But when I was 17, going on 18, and I was looking forward to being an adult and getting away to college, I was just like counting down the days that I could grow up and leave home and make my own decisions and just get away from the toxicity. And honestly, it was the best thing I could have done. Um, I moved two days drive away from home to go to college and I very rarely ever visited ever again. Um, and since then my family has disintegrated and there's been a lot of drama since that. Um, but I wasn't in the middle of it when it all happened, um, like physically at least, which was great. Um, it was good for me to be a little bit detached from this situation. But even when I got to college, because I was so used to toxic people, I kind of gravitated to this group and we had a funny name for ourselves. We liked to sit in the foyers in various parts of the college and uh, we were the, the foyer appreciation society and we would play card games after dinner time or whatever like that um, and not get our assignments done. And it was just, it was just really funny. Um, but after about my first semester, I think going into my second semester at college, I was like reflecting on the kind of people that I hung out with and they weren't like, really terrible people or anything they just were immature and I didn't see me being friends with them being a, a helpful part of my life and so over the next six months I started feeling like I really needed to detach myself from these people and find somebody else to hang out with and I still have a couple of friends from this group today some closer than others um but most of them I have never spoken to again since that time. And I'm not worried about that. Um, we've all moved on with our lives, living better lives, hopefully. Um, I know I am. Um, yeah, so I had to make the decision, which was super scary because I had no one else to be friends with at this point. Like there was all these people that I just kind of met. But I, I was like, if I leave this group who I've, kind of attached myself to for the past year, you know, who else am I going to hang out with? Um, and what ended up happening was a prayer group actually started with the security guards at college. And um, I started going to this prayer group and it was only a couple of us. It was like the two security guards and myself and one or two other people who might turn up sometimes. 
and I prayed and I told them, I think, I think I really need to leave these other people behind and find some new friends. And in the end, I actually became really close with the security guards and a couple of the people who started coming to prayer group. And this prayer group, I ended up going to it almost every single night that it was on, which was like four nights a week for every week for the next like four years that I was at college. Um, and that was so good for me because it meant I had this spiritual group of people who were dedicated to following God um, and praying and uplifting each other. And honestly, we all came together as grumpy, kind of horrible people at the start, but just being together in this group was so helpful and healing for each of us. And we all grew. And I, I like to laugh with one of the security guards, who's one of my good close friends now, saying, oh dear, we, we were we were very different people back then. Um, and we've, we've both grown so much from this experience. And so I found that group of people was really, really good um, for me to ally myself with. Um, and because allying with these, you know, Christ followers for me, um, you know, meant that I was allying myself with God as well. Like I can say that I'm a Christian, but if I have people around me who are not behaving like Christians really, and who are focusing on other things, then it really detracts from my relationship with God. Whereas this group of people, you know, I wasn't reading my Bible for a few years there. It was really hard for me to want to. But after a couple of years of going to prayer group, I realized I was using that as a crutch for my relationship with God. And it really made me actually seek God in my own time. And so, you know, my relationship with God has grown so much because of those people, just the, the small group of us coming together late at night in a foyer still um, to pray together, though, not just to play cards. So that's my story. Um, and... I hope you are able to get something good out of it and yeah, really think about who do you have in your life um, and do they need to stay there? Maybe you should pray about that and see um, if God's telling you about some somebody in your life who needs to stay and somebody else who needs to um, come, somebody who needs to go um, and how that can actually propel you into the purpose that God has placed in your life rather than detract from it. So yeah, that's all I have. I will see you again next Friday. Hopefully it will be a little bit earlier in the evening. <laughs> okay. See you guys. Bye.